Hello from the heartland. My name is Jenna, and this is Smarter News. News when it matters and why it matters. Our Smarter series features unique people who help us think and live smarter. Well, today I'm really excited to have a step back, deep breath conversation about what's going on with debt in America, which is a very big topic. And obviously, we've talked a lot about it over the last several weeks, talking about the debt ceiling deal, as we've been referring to it. But this has opened up a broader conversation about, well, what is the state of fiscal health in the United States of America? Like, what should we actually know, not only about the deal, but about some of these broader undercurrents that are part of the deal as well. And so we have a great guest today. Maya McGinnis is joining us. She's the the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. I've interviewed Maya over the years because not only is she an amazing source of information when it comes to anything regarding the fiscal health of the United States, she's one of the only sources out there that actually is part of a bipartisan (laughs) nonprofit so that can really kind of walk the line and give us some, some great perspective on on what's happening and why it matters, which is the whole point of uh, Smarter News. So my before we jumped on, you were telling me that you've you've been with uh, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget for some time now, and you actually remember the day when you joined the organization. So tell us a little bit about that and how you got started even becoming an expert on this topic. Okay, I will tell you. It's nice to join you on this. Um, yeah, I have been doing this work for 20 years. Um, how time flies. And uh, well, the reason I remember now is because I actually accepted the, the job the same day I found out I was pregnant with my first child. And that was a bit of a shocker. I actually hadn't realized I was pregnant um, and had to go to my board of directors, which was a lot of older men, um, and tell them that I was pregnant and taking the job, which led me to not take much of a maternity leave. I took three weeks and went back and quickly, quickly, yeah, learned really quickly that your brain is soft, that sleep deprivation <laughs> is a real problem. And I mastered the art of looking like I knew what was going on in meetings when I literally had no idea what the words meant. I will um, I will share my trade secret of how I got through this period of being really tired at work. But I learned that in a meeting, when everybody's talking, all you really need to do is just stop and say, Let's take a step back. Everybody (laughs) acts as though you've said something smart when really I was like, I am sleeping with my eyelids open. So (laughs) things are better now. I'm much more well rested. My kid is in college. (laughs) My second kid is senior in high school. It's all good. But yeah, I've been doing this forever and I never thought I would. I started in the world of think tanks and finance. And it was while I was working in Wall Street that I started watching what was going on with bond markets and what was how it connected to policy. And I read a couple of congressional budget office documents. And for some reason, I fell in love. And I fell in love with this issue because it strikes me as something that's so important to every other issue you care about, whether it's health care, whether it's national security, whether it's income inequality, growth. And it seemed really misunderstood in that we borrow a lot of times because politicians don't want to pay for hard things instead of that it's the right thing to do for the economy. So I really wanted to work in a nonpartisan environment talking about the importance of fiscal responsibility. And this this great job came along and basically handed me my dream job. And I've been here for 20 years and uh, continue plan to continue doing this work until we fix the debt, which isn't going to be time soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have to jump into that, but I just I, I have to go back. Let's take a step back. <laughs> now, I can, now I'm never going to be able to use that in an interview ever yeah. again. Everyone yeah. knows our secrets, <laughs> but I'm just thinking about a mom with a newborn and a new mom, no less. Yeah, um, first time mom didn't being, know what I was being, doing. <laughs> being part of conversations about how to fix the economy, the 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 budget issues, the fiscal issues in the largest economy in the world, and of course that would be yeah. an American woman, you there know, you with the baby on the side. <laughs> 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 Yes. All right. Well, that, but you know what? This is a personal topic. Debt and the fiscal strength of America is personal. It's personal to all of us. It impacts our family in very real ways. And then we have these moments where there's, you know, this negotiation happening over a debt ceiling and whether or not we're going to raise the debt ceiling or not and what that could cause in the economy, ours and around the world to like kind of startle us all to realize we're part of this much bigger ecosystem um, and, and understanding how that can impact us just in a real a very real way. So just broadly speaking, what is 
the fiscal state of America right now? How would you even describe it? Before we get to the debt ceiling deal and what we, what was just in front of us, you know, what is the situation? What should every American know? It's really bad. There's just no getting around it. So let me try to kind of paint the picture of where we are. The debt relative to the size of the economy is at just below 100%. It's about a 98% of GDP. Now, what does that mean? Is that good? Is that bad? The average in our country, it has been generally below 50%. So it's basically twice as high as it's been um, when we went into the financial crisis of 2009. That's where it was. It was much, much lower for the last 50 years on average. Wait, so I want to underscore that. So it hasn't always been this way. This hasn't Not been always the way it's been. This has been a very dramatic run up since the fiscal crisis, the financial crisis of 2009, where we borrowed a lot. And let me explain, there are times you actually want to borrow money. During recessions, during COVID, where we borrowed five to $6 trillion, absolutely the right thing to do. You need to borrow when your economy would otherwise be in free fall or you have a recession, which means you're producing less than you otherwise could or should. You kind of boost that up by additional borrowing. You also want to borrow when there's a national emergency. So during COVID, of course, we are going to borrow. There was much hardship that we had to deal with in trying to fight the pandemic. But what we do, we borrow trillions during emergencies. And then when the economy is strong again, just like we're doing now, we continue to borrow. And so in the years between the banking, the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, and COVID, we borrowed the entire time for most legislation that was passed. Up in the Trump years, there, pre-COVID, the president borrowed trillions of dollars, close to five or six trillion dollars before COVID hit, even though the economy was very strong for unpaid tax cuts and spending increases. And since we've gotten past COVID and the economy is strong again, President Biden has borrowed four to five trillion dollars, not looking, not counting COVID, just to pay for the bills of different things, even though there's an inflation, inflationary environment. And that's when you don't want to borrow. So my point there is not kind of saying he's done it, he's done it, he's done it, because guess what? They have all done it. It is politically convenient. But the point is that in the past decade plus, it's become more of the norm to borrow to pay for legislation, even when there's no economic reason to do so, rather than to pay for it. The reason is paying for things are hard. You have to either raise taxes or cut spending. Those are the things that every political advisor will tell politicians, stay away from those hard choices. Voters will punish you for it. And they may be right. It may be true that other than me, most people don't go to the voting booth and say, who's going to raise my taxes the most and cut my spending the most and vote for that person. But it's become more of the norm now not to pay for things. As a result, this debt is about to be the highest it's ever been compared to the economy in the whole history of the country. The highest it ever was was 106% of GDP right after World War II. And that's, we just fought a world war and then it took about four or five years and we balanced the budget because the economy grew, we cut spending, all sorts of good things happened. That's not the path we're on now. We're about to hit the record in the next five years. And at the same time, we are planning to borrow about 20 plus trillion dollars over the next decade even if we don't pass any new legislation that borrows, even if there's no new recessions. That's the current plan. That's a terrible plan. And just to kind of illustrate it in maybe ways that are easier to understand, because these numbers are so big, you know, none of us know what a trillion really is. But in the next five years, we will spend more on interest payments than we will on national defense. Or already, just this year alone, we will spend more on interest payments then we will spend for the entire federal bench budget on spending on children. So we're basically spending more to finance the borrowing of the past than investments in the future. That is a really dangerous trajectory to be on. So bottom line, the fiscal state of the country is really poor and we need to make changes. If we do not, it weakens us economically. It means our economy is weaker, our growth is slower, our wages are lower. It means we're less prepared for another crisis, whether it's COVID or you know, a, a, the next bad thing that happens, the next recession, it will be harder for us to borrow. And it weakens us from a foreign policy stance and from that in terms of national security, particularly as we have to borrow from other countries who we are dependent on, who we may not be aligned with. China, for instance, owns $900 billion of U.S. treasuries. All they have to do is talk about selling those. It would harm their economy, but it would also harm our economy. So as things are getting tenser between our countries, it's another kind of tool in their toolbox that they have that makes us vulnerable. And I think the bottom line 
is that being fiscally weak makes you vulnerable in a lot of different ways. And I really worry about the strength and the future trajectory of the country because of all the borrowing we've done so far and our plans to keep borrowing instead of figuring out how to really align the fiscal situation with what we need to. How do we fix it? Ah, we do all those things that the politicians aren't dying to do. But it's actually, this is not a policy problem. We know what we need to do. The problem is so big right now with us planning to borrow $20 trillion over the next decade. We have to put every single thing on the table. We are about to enter a presidential election where we are going to hear promises from everybody about what they will not do. We're going to hear Republicans promise not to raise taxes and Democrats promise not to raise taxes on anybody who's making less than $400,000. We're going to hear everybody, starting with both President Biden and President Trump, promising not to fix Social Security and Medicare. When those two programs are headed towards insolvency, and what that means is that their trust funds will not have enough money to pay for all the benefits they've promised within about a decade. So people who are depending on Social Security or Medicare are, if we don't make changes, which is exactly what we have to do, they're going to have 23% benefit cuts across the board, to Social Security benefits for everybody, for Bill Gates, for the widow who depends on the program for all of her benefits, for everybody. And in Medicare, they're going to have 10% plus cuts to the, to the providers, which means we won't have enough health care to meet the needs of everybody. So that plan's stupid. What we need to do is really, really bad. What we need to do is fix these programs in advance. We should have done it not just years ago, but decades ago. But on Social Security, I mean, let's just be direct. We're going to have to look at things like, do we raise the payroll tax cap or the payroll tax rate, which is what finances the program? Do we raise the retirement age gradually to reflect that we're living longer? Do we means test benefits so that people who don't need them don't get as high benefits? Right now, they get higher benefits than low-income people. Do we change the way we calculate inflation? Um, do we change benefits in a different way? Now, every politician out there promises not to touch them for current retirees, and that's a smart political promise. But we need to make those changes and phase them in for people who aren't at retirement yet so we can phase them and gradually let them know what's going to happen. Well, and let's be clear about something. With some of these programs, just talking about the entitlement programs for a moment, if nothing is done something will happen, yes. correct? Can you talk about that? Because for, for, for everyone that's sort of floating along, myself included, thinking, well, I, I guess we're not going to figure this out. And maybe, I don't know, things will look different for me when I'm older. Sure, I paid into Social Security and all of this, but I don't know what's going to happen. If we don't do anything, something's still going to happen, right? What is that thing that will happen? Well, that's that 23% cut to all benefits. So let me personalize it to my dad, who is awesome. But anytime I'm out there talking about the need to reform Social Security, he's like, Maya, keep your hands off my Social Security. I paid into it. And then I have to say, like, I know, Dad, you you paid into it. And this, it gets more complicated. But because you paid Social Security and the Social Security trust funds lent that money for the rest of the budget, the rest of your taxes were much lower. He paid into Social Security, but at the same time had lower taxes because the way Social Security works, and it was the right thing to do, but the way it works, the extra money in Social Security was lent to the rest of the government and paid for defense and environment and energy and everything. Now we're repaying that back to Social Security. Those of us who are still working are paying higher taxes to repay it. But the big thing is he's living much longer than they ever thought. When Social Security started, retirement age was 65. Life expectancy was 62. Right now that he's in his mid 80s and is probably going to live to he's going to live for quite some time is my guess. He's going to have taken out much, much more than he paid into the system. And that's what you want. You want insurance to protect people who live longer. But you don't want a system that structurally says we're pretty much for the most part going to live longer than this system will be able to afford, but not adjust the benefits. So we have to switch this. Otherwise, his benefits will be cut 23 percent across the board. And he doesn't. And is that you, is that sort of the gauntlet? Is that sort of the gauntlet that falls, Maya? That twenty three percent. If for some reason it gets to the point where it's just not working, is that is, is there an automatic great, cut? Great question. And let me just say, I don't worry about my dad as much as I worry about the person who depends on it for everything. That is devastating. I don't think we'll let that happen. But how we're going forward with the plan that that is the plan that that's the default, and you have people who are running for president and have been presidents and are presidents saying they're not going to do anything. That's reckless. Now, the reason that it works this way is once we hit the, pro the where the program doesn't have enough money to pay full benefits, it still pays out as much as the money that's coming in is. So as much as the trust funds have, 
that will be about 75, 77% of what's owed at the time. So it will pay a chunk of benefits, but not all. Some people will be able to weather those cuts. Many will not at all. And it doesn't make sense. Basically, politicians are saying, I'm not going to do my job. I'm not going to fix this program. Therefore, we have a really bad plan, which we are hurtling towards. And I'm not even going to tell the truth because almost all the politicians out there are saying, I will not touch these benefits. When what they should say, again, my big rule for fiscal policy is don't tell me what you won't do. Tell me what you will do. Social Security needs to be fixed. Medicare needs to be fixed. To be direct, we're going to need more revenues. We can't do this without revenues. And we have to deal with a major debt problem in this country that's going to require probably around the neighborhoods of $8 trillion in savings. Tell me what you're going to do to right this ship. Because not doing that, it's not leadership, and it really leaves the country vulnerable. You can tell. I get worked up about this issue. Yeah. But to me, it's a I'm getting worked up about it. Now I'm, now I'm really worried. <laughs> when I started looking at it, I thought, oh, there must be an excuse. There must be a reason it's okay to borrow. It's not. It's not good for us. It makes much more sense if something's worth doing, and there are many things we should do. It's not about the size of government. You might might want big government. You might want small government. But whatever you have, you should be willing to pay for it rather than borrowing and handing that bill to the future when that future already has a lot of big challenges on the horizon they're going to have to deal with as well. So what is one thing that, and we'll, then we'll move on to the debt ceiling and sort of the deal that was done and whether or not that that there was something good in it or bad in it or what we should know about it. If Democrats or Republicans, who, by the way, the candidates that are running, the candidates that could be running, those that will be in, in leadership, if they could do one significant thing, what could you prioritize that? What would, what would be one thing that you would love to hear from either side that you think would actually make a significant difference and kind of put us on the right path? So the biggest thing would be, I'm going to fix Social Security and make it solvent for the future. That would involve multiple things. That would mean I'm going to gradually raise the retirement age. I'm going to slow the growth of benefits for people who don't need them. And I'm going to lift the payroll tax cap so that we're putting more money in the system. That's kind of a big cohesive thing. Um, but if it was just and I'm not going to take one, I'm going to take two. <laughs> there are two things I would have them say, we're going to raise the retirement age gradually and index it to life expectancy. Nobody who's close to retirement or in retirement will be affected, but younger people will be. Um, and number two, either put in a carbon tax and use some of that money for a lot of different deficit reduction. You can also have rebates or different things if you need, or get rid of a bunch of tax breaks. We lose about a trillion and a half dollars a year in tax breaks. Don't get me wrong, we all love those tax breaks, but they're very inefficient. They're bad ways to do public policy. So I would just basically put a haircut and say nobody can get more than X amount of their income in tax breaks and require that they may not lose as much revenue. I think that could be a smart way to raise revenue. I know nobody wants to do any of these things. This is the hard stuff. The easy stuff is borrowing. That's why we do it so much. And my favorite thing would be to have a politician go out and run for president just to tell the truth to the American people about this topic and push the other candidates to be responsible. I'm really worried we will come out of the next presidential election with a huge mandate of all the things we aren't going to do instead of a mandate to fix this problem before it really becomes too late. What did you think about the debt ceiling deal? and the bipartisan support for it eventually as it got through. There were so many different things that were said. Even for, as a journalist trying to follow the story, it was very difficult to back away from it and say, bottom line, this is what it is. Can, can you do that for us, Maya? What did you think about the debt ceiling deal that came about? Were there any significant spending cuts of note? And generally, what do you think is the major takeaways? So, and I don't get to say this very often. I loved it. It was really, real. I did. It was a really good success. And I'll tell you why. Um, first off, I mean, leading into it, my God, it was really setting up to be a brutal battle. And I've never thought we would default in this country. And I didn't think we would default, but I thought there was a small risk of it. And we should never be in that situation. We should never be worried that we're going to default because that would be a terribly painful, self-imposed own goal, goal to our economy. That would be pretty devastating. What I really liked about this, this deal was three things. One, it did lift the debt ceiling. And the debt ceiling many times in the past has been very productive. Along with left, lifting it, we often do include policies that will make the debt better. I will say that the past three out of four times, the three debt ceiling increases under President Trump, the Democrats kept saying, we want a clean debt ceiling increase. But they were complicit in this. When we lifted the debt ceiling under President Trump three times, 
And President Trump had said, we should default if you don't get a good enough deal. That is a terribly reckless thing to say. But I do want to point out that when he lifted it, he passed bills that made the debt worse three times to the tune of $2.1 trillion. That's the worst thing you can do. Lift the debt ceiling and incur more borrowing at the same time. The best thing you could do, which we've done many times in the past, is lift the debt ceiling, which you have to because it reflects borrowing we've already committed to, but also put in place measures that will improve the debt. We've done that in the past with putting in the Simpson Bowles Commission, spending caps, savings, pay to go rules. And that's what they ended up doing here, which I think is the right model if you take the threat of default off the table, which wasn't done strongly enough in my opinion. But here's what I saw. They lifted the debt ceiling, we averted default. They put in place a plan that will save one to possibly one and a half or two trillion dollars if they're aggressive about it. Out of what I said that we really need eight trillion dollars in savings, that is a significant amount, particularly given that this wasn't like a big whole, we're putting everything, they didn't put everything on the table. They are only negotiating on a small part of the budget. And it was a pretty hostile environment. I think they got a very good deal in terms of savings that will be a start. Nowhere close to getting the deal done. But given that almost all legislation that we've passed in recent times has been about borrowing, merely the shift to something that made the debt better instead of worse is a huge pivot in the direction that's correct. And then the third thing that I think was good, we avoided default. They had significant savings. They did it in what we really need to do, but bipartisan compromise. Nobody likes what's in this package. Nobody got what they wanted. Nobody, I mean, you have the choice. You can go around and point out the good things about the deal, of which there are many, or you can say, well, we should have gotten more, or we shouldn't have done this at all, or work requirements, this good, this bad. Like they can fight about everything. That means we compromised. And I know we're out of practice of that because everybody's convinced right now that what they believe is the absolute right thing. I mean, if I'd had my right thing, this debt deal would have been much, much bigger and not done on the debt ceiling, done separately through the budget process. That's what I would have liked. But this was really good given all the parameters that were there. And it could potentially be the start of many productive next steps. The best thing they could do is now form a fiscal commission, which is something that would give them a little bit more cover and say, now we're going to look at the real structural problems in the country, retirement, health care, revenues. we got to look at defense. I think we're going to have to make some shifts in how our defense budget works. We're going to put everything on the table and we're going to go for it and try to really fix the problem. We just got you a great down payment. Now let's keep the momentum going. Will that happen? Would you- I don't know, but I would love to see it happen. Would you serve on a commission like that if it if it came about? You know, um, I mean, of course, as an expert, I would, but I don't think it needs experts. I think it needs members of Congress. So I think the mm. best way is to have it made up of members of Congress. Then you can have outside experts who come in and talk to them. The role that I'm lucky enough to play often is I really am bipartisan. I'm a diehard political independent. I have I am the undecided voter in most elections who wait until the last minute. Like I'm listening through every debate, trying to decide who to vote for. That gives me a strange ability to talk to both sides and I am I am not pushing anything. So sometimes there's a nice role where I can be helpful that way. More often than that, it just means that both sides are mad at us at the committee because we are pushing the hard things they don't like. But I think what they'll want to do is bring a lot of experts from all the different sides who can say, here's my ideas. Like I can serve in a way that's useful for saying, here's a lot of the tough choices you might not want to think about that would be helpful and give them even more cover that way. But in the end on a commission, I think you need the members of Congress who are gonna be the ones who end up who end up really working on this. And there are a lot of great members who they should bring together and they should build working relationships, learn about the issues, and I believe they could make some real progress. You've, you've talked to many different lawmakers over the years. Do you think generally that lawmakers understand the issues and challenges that we're facing and do they understand what would it take to fix it? Is there an understanding of the situation overall? It's a great question with a complicated answer. Um, I do for many, probably most of them, but I also think there has been a deterioration in the situation where there are more members who don't understand it at all, don't really care to understand it, and believe some of the political talking points or narratives that, that their party is putting out there that just honestly aren't accurate. And I think there are more people who believe those who are serving in Congress than I've ever seen before. 
can you give us an example of something? We probably have heard it ourselves. Is there an example from each party you could yeah. you could point yeah. out to us? Yeah. And 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 God, there's so many members who are so smart. And when I sit and I think, all I do is this one thing, budget policy. They do this and Ukraine and AI and environment. I mean, really credit to them, kudos to them for all the incredible work that they do. But there are storylines out there that many of them believe. And I'll yeah, I'll start with two big ones. Tax cuts don't pay for themselves. They just don't. There are a lot of people who desperately want to believe they do. And there's numbers that are out there. They're not correct. The truth is tax cuts do help us grow the economy. The less we tax, the more we can promote economic growth. It's incredibly helpful. But the growth is not enough to generate a replacement for the dollars we've lost in tax cuts. It generates about a fifth to a quarter of the revenues that's lost. So you can't borrow and say tax cuts will make up all the money. And we've heard that the Trump tax cuts have made up the money. That's actually not true. It was a bunch of short-term growth that came from additional borrowing. We've seen numbers recently that so show us revenues that are coming down dramatically as a share of the economy are right where the Congressional Budget Office predicted they'd be after the tax cuts, not paying for themselves. Anyhow, that's a myth that's great. Do I wish tax cuts paid for themselves? Yes, I do. That would be a lot of fun. We could pay no taxes. But it's not true. So if we want to cut taxes, which is totally legitimate to want, we also have to cut spending. That's the other side. Now, on the Democratic side, we've heard a lot recently about, don't worry, deficits don't matter. We can just borrow more. And frankly, there's a printing press. So if we get into trouble, we can just print more money. Absurd, dangerous, outrageous. Part of the reason that we have high inflation right now is because we borrowed too much as part of the American Rescue Plan. We borrowed much, much more than was needed. We ginned up the economy so fast that inflation hit, and then we got hit with other things in terms of supply chains and oil prices, what was going on in Russia and Ukraine contributed further. But if you borrow too much and if you gin up the printing presses, you will hit inflation, which is so much more devastating to the economy than people realize often because it's very hard to control. It's very hard to stop. And so this notion that deficits don't matter not only risks inflation, it also pushes all of the responsibility into the future. And like I've said, if you look at this gen younger generation, they have plenty of challenges to handle. And we are handing them tens of trillions of dollars of debt on top of that, meaning their budget is going to be really hamstrung for doing them. So tax cuts don't pay for themselves. Deficits do matter. And the final one is to everybody, stop saying we don't have to do things on Social Security and Medicare. We do. We do. You know, thinking about what 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 you mentioned about the the Democrats saying that we can still borrow, and also thinking about President Trump and what you said about some of the the that he that there were more deficits created. Is do, do, am I phrasing that correctly? As he was raising the debt ceiling, as the de debt ceiling yes. was raising it, right. he also you passed know, legislation that increased the debt at the same time. Yeah. So. Uh, as a he has a background as a as a real estate mogul, and there are those, as you know, on Wall Street from a variety of different yeah. political backgrounds that will say, "Hey, we can use debt. We're going to yeah. use debt to our benefit." You know, when you carry debt, you look stronger that you're able to support that debt. We and I'm speaking very generally. Hey, we can borrow against that debt, and then we and we're able to invest in here and there, and you know, so the debt sort of just keeps rolling, and we're gonna we're gonna use it to our benefit. Um, is there anything to that argument that the strongest economy in the world also carries a big balance sheet and therefore somehow we also can can continue to grow that way? Is there anything to that that we should consider? I think here's the things where I would, I mean, hmm, how to say this? Uh, that argument usually is not based in accurate reasons, but the reasons to think about that. First, we need some debt. When somebody says we should pay off the debt, no, no, no. We need some debt because debt is actually the treasury market. The way we borrow is through treasury bills, bonds, and notes. The treasury market is the backbone of the global financial economy. That's a great thing. We're very lucky that we're in the middle of that. Our treasuries are great assets. We should stop threatening to default. And so we always want some level of debt. The problem is that our debt is too high, so much higher than it's been, and growing. That's the real problem. Number two, it makes sense to borrow if what you're borrowing in and investing in will lead to higher returns. So the problem is our budget is about 85% consumption and about 15% investment. If we turn that on its head, we could borrow a lot more. If we were borrowing to invest 
it would make much more sense to say, I'm going to spread out the cost of this infrastructure bill over 10 or 20 or even 50 years. Or don't worry, if we invest in these things, they will be able to help us grow the economy in a way that will cover this. Now, you still have to pay for them to some extent. You can't let just like cutting taxes doesn't pay for itself. Investments don't pay for itself, but you wouldn't have to pay for all of it and you could spread the costs. But what we are borrowing for is consumption. Just to keep this in mind, the federal government spends six dollars per senior on every one it spends on children under 18. That is, to me, the biggest data point of how we're choosing to spend our budget. So that's a lot of consumption. Um, again, sorry, Dad. I know a lot of these programs are worthwhile, <laughs> but they don't. They aren't smart to borrow for. You've got to pay for them. Um, and then the third. And if I could just if I could just stop you there too, Maya, I'm just thinking about it just practically. It would be like borrowing so that you could fill your house with new furniture versus borrowing to actually put an addition on your house that then raises its value, right? You so it's, it's it, we don't want to fill it with furniture. You want to actually use the money to then create more wealth for you. And so we're just making the wrong choice. A hundred percent. Running up your credit card to go on a shopping spree is different than running up your credit card to start a small business. There are times to borrow. There's no, I'm absolutely, we're not a group that's anti-borrowing. We're a group that's saying, you've got to borrow for the right reasons. And we're borrowing for all political expediency. The right reasons are if there's an emergency, if it's a really smart investment that will work and you're not borrowing too much for other things, if you want to spread the cost over time, there are plenty of reasons, but those aren't things that we're doing. And politicians plain and simple, are borrowing because it's really hard to pay for things and they don't like the hard parts of their jobs. And as they are locked in a death match between Republicans and Democrats, they are much more focused on beating the other side than governing in a way that is conducive to the long-term health of the economy. Got it. Wow. All right. This is, I, I've just gotten totally taken up in this conversation. I, just so everyone knows, I told Maya, I was like, 10, 15 minutes. We're just going to talk yeah. about this. It's going to be so easy. And then it's like, no, just kidding. Yeah. This is a lot. I mean, I have a million more questions, but I am going to finish up here because you've been so generous with your time. And I'm curious about this, Maya. So, and I'll use a little personal anecdote because I'm going to ask you the, sort of a personal reflection. One of my first big news stories I covered was the financial crisis. So mm. 2008, you know, we're, we're talking about, and it's very difficult to go back to that time. I can close my eyes and think about going into work at one o'clock in the morning at a five o'clock show on that, at that time uh, on the business network um, on Fox business. And, and it was chaos. Yes. You know, there were moments in the morning where you thought, is the global banking system going to survive? You saw people walking out of offices at one o'clock in the morning carrying their boxes because their bank had just collapsed. I mean, it was really frightening. And in a lot of ways, that was in my late 20s, that informed my decisions for the rest of my life as far as my own fiscal policy at home. You know, I didn't like any debt. By the, I, if I could save just a little bit of money, paid my student loans. You know, I was afraid of debt for a long time because I saw this play out in front of me. And, you know, there, as you point out, it's always good to have a little bit of debt. Um, it, it, maybe there's different, th you know, maybe Dave Ramsey disagrees with that, <laughs> but, there, but there's, you know, there's different thinking on debt, but that was my, per you know, that's how I internalized it. And I'm curious after 20 years of working in this, in this particular area, has that impacted how you you know, make your own personal decisions? What has been a personal takeaway watching this play out on the government level? That's a really great question. I think maybe part of why I got attracted to this is because I was brought up in one of those households where it was like, you should save up to buy a car rather than finance a car. That was just sort of my bringing because of my parents' generation, their experience, you know, doesn't always work out that way. Obviously you have to borrow for some things, but I have always believed that you borrow to invest, not to consume, except maybe at the holiday season. You have one month where you borrow. <laughs> but um, so that's a little bit how I am. And I don't mean to like sound like I live my life perfectly the way I want to be. I am somebody who wishes I were the way I want to be more than it is the way I am. Um, Amen. But watching this, it's, it's led me to something. It's less that it's impacted my fiscal beliefs. What it's really impacted is so this this organization's two things. It's all about fiscal policy, but it's also about bipartisan compromise, those things. What this experience has really led me to believe is a lot of people have a lot of legitimate ideas and preferences that don't all line up with each other. And that, in my mind, is the beauty of the diversity of America. Like, sorry to sound like a politician right here, but like 
we are this diverse country. We have different ideas. That is awesome. That increases the richness of who we are and who we can be. And the big problem that we have is thinking that our own idea is the only right one. This feels much more recent to me. It didn't used to feel like this. And that being so convinced that I am right and someone else is wrong and then actually disliking them or to the point of hating them because you have different opinions. That's what this is affecting me to think a lot about, which is how do we build more empathy for different points of view? How do we recognize that this country is going to crumble if we continue to dig our heels in and saying like my way or the highway? I mean, again, was this debt ceiling deal my dream deal? Of course not. I think we need to make huge changes, but I am blown away kind of with admiration and awe for the people who negotiated it and were able to come up with these hard choices. And it is easy to sit on the cheap seats and throw grenades and say like, well, you didn't do this. You should have done this. They would have done better. Nuh -uh. This stuff's really hard. And I'm one of those people in the cheap seats sitting on the side for those people who are putting together deals. I think it's really important to recognize the importance of compromising and how hard that is and that it can reflect better outcomes than each one of us thinking that we have the answers to everything. So yes, I believe in fiscal responsibility, but what I really believe in, and this happens more as I get older, but more increasing a humility of like, what if I'm wrong on these things? Um, you know, what, if, or what if my preference on how to fix social security is the wrong one? We should fix it. I'm pretty sure of that, but there's so many ways to fix it. And we should really just be discussing all those different options kind of with respect and understanding for the different points of view. So that's what I've taken away from the past 20 years. Well, that's a, that's a really great takeaway. It's everybody in the pool. Everyone jumps in the pool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the pool party is better when everybody's swimming. So let's get everybody in the pool. Yeah. And that's, yeah. it's, it's a new visual. <laughs> you can use it. If you're in front of yeah. Congress testifying, please feel free to borrow that. <laughs> but then, you know what? I, I'm left. That's such a great way to kind of end here and also reflect back on the beginning of our conversation, which is it wasn't always like that. It wasn't yeah. always like this, that we were, this is the financial situation we're in. And it is easy to think, well, this is just the way it is. This is just the way, you know, politicians work. And as you point out, that's not always the way it was fiscally. And what we're experiencing right now politically wasn't always the way that it was. There's been harder times. There's been better times. And so it's in a, a good re reminder to continue to evolve. So um, Maya, it's great to have you. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you'll come back and I'm going to be listening now more attunely to what, you know, what leaders are saying about debt and especially about some of these entitlement programs like social security. So thank you for your work, for your 20 years of work and for spending some time with us as well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing Smarter.